Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome to all of you to our second Beauty and Solitude Dialogue. My name is Aisha Imam, and I'm the director of uh, Reed Society for the Sacred Arts, a 501c3 art organization based outside of Washington, DC in Bethesda, Maryland. Our mission here is to preserve and promote the traditions of sacred art and music. We support a network of artists and musicians through our work with universities, museums, as well as grassroots organizations to further our mission. When the pandemic began, as in many places, everything came to a screeching halt. It was a surreal time and one that coincided with the Washington DC cherry blossom season. Because of the pause button that we all abruptly hit, this cherry blossom season became otherworldly for me and it brought to mind a lot of the poetry of Japanese calligraphers that I love and the themes of their work. Cherry blossoms representing the transitory nature of life and the importance of solitude. I also realized how much I missed my, my uh, calligraphy lessons with Hoja Mohammed Zakaria, a master calligrapher residing in the DC area and who I'm grateful to be um, a struggling student of eight years of. I also missed my fellow aspiring calligraphy students who I used to see weekly or bi-weekly at his studio. So it was in this mood of nostalgia, contemplation and solitude really that beauty and solitude took root. Beauty and Solitude is an online calligraphy exhibition that we curated in collaboration with the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. We asked a family of practicing master calligraphers to share their thoughts, their works, and their studios at the time of the initial shutdown. We began the exhibition with a piece by Sheikh Hamdullah, who is considered to be the father of Ottoman calligraphy. Sheikh Hamdullah was the royal calligrapher in the Court of, in the royal court of Sultan Bayezid II, who lived around uh, 1500s. This is about 1500s. Sultan Bayezid had acquired a collection that he was really thrilled by. And it, it was a collection similar to what Evan Croft will be sharing with us shortly. Um, he had seven pieces uh, by Yakut al-Mustasami, who was up to that time the standard of all calligraphy. An, imp an important aside, Yakut lived about two or 300 years before Sheikh Hamdullah and Sultan Bayezid. He was Greek in origin and very interestingly, he learned the art of calligraphy at the hand of a female scholar and calligrapher by the name of Shohda bint al-Ibari, who herself was a student in the direct line of Ibn al-Bawab. Anyway, Sultan Bayezid had this collection and he was thrilled by it. And he approached Sheikh Hamdullah and asked him, perhaps it would be possible if he could develop something new, something different, something better. Sheikh Hamdullah didn't think so. He didn't believe that Yakud's calligraphy could be surpassed, but at the Sultan's insistence, he agreed and he entered into a period of seclusion. It was in this time of solitude that he was inspired by new scripts and refined the old ones. From this point on, the new style was widely adopted and endured for almost 150 years before it became further refined by other calligraphers. Incidentally, there are only three institutions in the United States that hold a piece of Sheikh Hamdullah's calligraphy. The first one is the Walters Art Museum where this beautiful album or muraka'a of Sheikh Hamdullah is housed. The University of Michigan, which Evan will be guiding us through today, and the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. Our first Beauty and Solitude dialogue was with the curator, Dr. Ashley Dimmick, who shared this album in great detail. And she was in conversation with Dr. Emin Lelich, an Ottomanist and a professor of history. If you would like to learn more about Sheikh Hamdullah or this album, please do go to our YouTube channel to hear this talk. Our next Beauty and Solitude dialogue will take place in January, where we have invited Dr. Ekhtiar, the curator at the Met, and she'll be in conversation with Hoja Nuria Garcia Mesap, a master calligrapher residing in, in Paris. To uh, stay abreast of this event and others, please follow us on Instagram or go to our website and uh, join our mailing list. So then we skipped centuries, and we focused on Hoja Muhammad Zakaria, who cuts a unique and formidable figure in the landscape of Islamic art history. 
Certainly people have been practicing the art of calligraphy in North America and Europe from the beginning, but one could say that Hoxha Zakaria actually brought the institution of calligraphy single-handedly to the United States and planted its seeds deep in this side of the world. Whereas there is an ecosystem that calligraphers depend on in Turkey or Iran or in other places, Hoxha Zakaria has has brought the institution by making the ink himself that he uses, the columns he sculpts, to the paper he writes on, Ebru and Illumination. He taught himself Arabic and Ottoman Turkish in order to learn what other previous calligraphers could share. Without a doubt, he has taught hundreds of students and conveyed a, only a handful the ijazat or the master scribe degree. And we are honored to have one of them here with us today, and he's here in the top left image. Allow me to uh, formally introduce you to the curator and calligrapher for today's um, dialogue. Evan Croft curates the Islamic Manuscripts Collection preserved in the Special Collections Research Center at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and leads workshops on Islamic manuscript culture. Her research interests center around Islamic code ecology and Arabic manuscript culture with a focus on writing materials, structural repairs, reading and collecting during the Ottoman era, as well as the significance of pictograms and other visual content for Sufi knowledge transmission. She has a bachelor's degree in material science and engineering from the University of Texas, Knoxville, and a master's degree in information science from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where she also studied Islamic history, Arabic hist historiography, classical Arabic, and Ottoman Turkish. From 2009 to 2012, she led the descriptive effort, which realized the detailed cataloging of 904 Arabic, Persian, and Turkish manuscripts preserved in the SCRC. Bravo, Evan. Dr. Nihad Dukan is an Arab American artist and a professor of mechanical engineering. As a native of Gaza, Palestine, his interest in Arabic calligraphy began when he was in the sixth grade. To polish his training in the traditional styles of Arabic calligraphy, he trained with the Is with Istanbul master, Istanbul-based grandmaster Hoja Hassan Chalabi in Sulus and Nessi styles, and received his ijaza after 11 years of study. He also, as we mentioned, studied with Hoja Muhammad Zakaria in the Talik style and received his ijaza in this script in 2013 after six years of study. In addition to traditional calligraphy, Dr. Dukan produces designs in his free modern form. His work has been exhibited in major US cities and sold in the United States, Europe, Middle East, and Japan. I'm immensely honored to present these two guests to all of you. And Evan will begin uh, showing, sharing images from the Sultan Abdul Hamid II's collection. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, Nihad. And thank you to all of you who have joined us for this conversation, including our partners and, and tech support. It is an honor to be in community together with all of you this evening and to celebrate this heritage of generations of calligraphers, marblers, illuminators, and other artisans trained in the traditions which flourished with the Ottoman masters. As Aisha has mentioned, our conversation this evening emerges out of the Beauty and Solitude exhibition, a meditation on the thriving lineage which we will see embodied in Nihad this evening and which through Zakaria Hoja and his teachers reaches from contemporary artists back many centuries to an incredibly important figure in the history of Islamic calligraphic traditions, the 15th century Ottoman master, Sheikh Hamdallah. For my part, I will point to the historical resonances of this lineage, which extends from Sheikh Hamdallah as it is embodied in works carefully preserved by Ottoman collectors and now stewarded in the University of Michigan Library tracing forward along the chain of transmission, which reaches Nihad. Sheikh Hamdallah was born in Amasya, a town in the mountains near the Black Sea in central Anatolia. He complemented his traditional education with training in calligraphy and the six pens or scripts elaborated by the 13th century calligrapher Yakut and Mustasimi. In Amasya, Fatah Sultan Mahmoud son Bayezid, who was serving as governor, befriended Sheikh Hamdallah and studied calligraphy with him. 
Bayezid had tremendous respect and admiration for his teacher. He was later said to have held his inkwell for him. And when he succeeded to the throne in Istanbul in 1481 as Bayezid II, he invited Sheikh Hamdallah to join him there. Sheikh Hamdallah accepted and became master calligrapher at the Ottoman court. There, he had access to remarkable collections, including the works of Yaqud al-Mustasimi himself. Carefully examining these works, he elaborated a style of his own, eventually achieving an extraordinary prominence, which remained unparalleled in influence until the refinement of Hafiz Osman, more than 150 years later. We can't say just how many students learned calligraphy from Sheikh Hamdallah, but they were many. Upon his death in 1520 and his burial in the Karaj Ahmed Cemetery in Uskudar, students continued seeking blessings in visits to his grave. Two albums carefully preserving Sheikh Hamdallah's work are now stewarded in the Islamic Manuscripts Collection of the Special Collections Research Center at the University of Michigan Library under the shelf marks 244 and 236. They are part of a remarkable assemblage of calligraphic exemplars collected in the sphere of the Ottoman court, echoing the practice among Muslim rulers and their associates of cultivating libraries and workshops as institutions within the courtly sphere. These institutions were repositories compiling and embodying the cultural, scholarly, and spiritual heritage and legacy of the sovereign, important for the transmission of spiritual power and agency. Collections were inherited, but also expanded by way of gift and exchange with other sovereigns or even seizure during conquest, as well as through commissions. It was considered a noble act to support poets, writers, calligraphers, illuminators, painters, paper artists, and others in their crafts, and to commission works from them and collect those works, as well as to preserve the works of earlier artisans. These collected works were often selected and reimagined in albums for courtly appreciation, consultation, and gifting. Artisans were gathered at court, were extended patronage, and were granted access to the many exemplars already collected and preserved. And these works already within the archives could then be consulted as models for imitation in the practice known as taklid, imitation, or training and homage. Just as Sheikh Hamdallah did with the works of Yaqut al-Mustasimi, which were made accessible to him at the court of Sultan Bayez II, and which subsequent masters did with the works of Sheikh Hamdallah, in particular, Hafiz Osman. Hafiz Osman studied with Nafiz Zadi Sayyid Ismail Afandi and Sayyid Jukhsari Mustafa Ayubi, as well as with his teacher Dervish Ali, who studied with Khaled Erzurumi, who studied with Hassan Uskudari, who studied with Pir Mehmet bin Shukrallah, who studied with Shukrallah Khalifa, who studied with Sheikh Hamdallah. Hafiz Osman initially followed the method of Sheikh Hamdallah, furthering his training with Nafis Sade, and after his second credentialing, studying Sheikh Hamdallah's works directly using the taklid method of imitation. In fact, his works became an important source for understanding the style of Sheikh Hamdallah. He eventually transitioned to his own refined style, just as Sheikh Hamdallah had done, opening a new refinement upon the style of Yaqut. Hafiz Usman and others would have consulted pieces authentically created by Sheikh Hamdallah, accessible to them in the rich collections at court and in courtly spheres. As with the calligraphic works of other masters, Sheikh Hamdallah pieces were carefully collected and treasured, with even small samples of his writing painstakingly conserved, remounted, and set off with new illumination and decorative papers, often marbled or dyed and gold sprinkled. One of the Sheikh Hamdallah albums now preserved in the university library under the shelf mark 236 is exemplary in this regard. Now an album of five pieces, the excerpts comprise the text of a well-known prayer for concluding the recitation of the entire Quran, which is often included by the calligrapher following the conclusion of the Quranic text in a mushaf or copy of the Quran. The polished paper bears graceful lines of script and it has been carefully pieced and pasted in new mounts. Here you can see the edges of the paper fragments as well as the impression of the ruling board with blind rules to guide the calligrapher's line of writing. 
Of course, these are set off with illumination, flanking each sample in the cultural adjacent to the central written area. And they have been set in inner and outer frames of colored and gold sprinkled papers, which are themselves set off with gold and colored rules. The piecing, mounting, and illumination almost certainly took place in the first half of the 18th century when the pieces were provided with the attestation statements that appear at the close. These speak to the authenticity as a specimen in the hand of the late Sheikh, which we understand to refer to Sheikh Hamdallah. And the 18th century signatories of the statements include some illustrious names, among them, Eru Koplan Mehmet Rasim Afendi, who's a renowned student of Sayyid Abdullah of Yudikile, Sayyid Abdullah's son and student, Emir Afindizade Sayyid Abdul Halim, accompanied by his seal, which bears a date you may be able to see in this area. And two honored Yahyas, likely Yahya Farahdin, student of Ikinji Darvish Ali, and possibly Kirishji Yahya Afendi. Therefore, we can date the compilation of the album and the mounting of the Sheikh Hamdallah pieces to no earlier than 1722, corresponding to the date in the seal, and no later than 1756, when a number of the signatories departed this world. Beyond this album of conserved excerpts, there is another album of assorted pieces, Kitalar, of Sulus and Naseh script, preserved under shelf mark 244. The album opens vertically in an accordion format called Kurukulu Muraka, and the Kitalar have been exquisitely mounted in colored, pieced, and marbled papers. Here is the opening kita distinct from the others with the Vesmina and then an opening for the speech of the Prophet Muhammad. The subsequent kita is the opening of a sequence carrying hadith excerpts pertaining to the sentiments of Kisra and Shirvan with a distinct line of sulus under which are centered five lines of Nasr with the culticlar spaces on either side spared elaborate illumination in this case. The marbled papers are incredibly rich as are the frames of cut paper pieced to form these arrays of colored bands. Subsequently, the format shifts to a single line of sulus beneath which appear mainly eight lines of nasikh on the diagonal. Here though, we have nine. And the format or layout then shifts back again and back once again and so on. For facing folios, the marbled papers do not match, but the frames of colored paper do. And so within the album, with it opening vertically, you would have this piece above and this below. The sequence with the text ends abruptly and incompletely here with this kita, which as Zakaria Hoja has graciously informed me has a historical resonance with a taklid which Hassan Riza made of it in the late 19th century, also stopping in the same place. Thereafter appear a few other uh, pieces, including a colophon piece. It so happens that these albums collecting and carefully conserving Sheikh Hamdallah's work are just two of many calligraphic specimens within the collection at the University of Michigan Library. This remarkably rich portion of the current collection was acquired by the university in a purchase brokered by the Kyrene dealer Marius Nahman in the 1920s. Nahman obtained the collection from a dealer who, as the Ottoman Empire was collapsing, went seeking valuable manuscripts being sold out of the estates of the former rulers and elites. The former owner was identified as one Khalis Pasha, though Nahman claimed the manuscripts had come from the court understood to be the library of Sultan Abdul Hamid II. In fact, there is no clear tie to the library of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, apart from the bindings of four massive albums of calligraphic works. Numerous other former owners are named in the collection, however, important statesmen and officials with ties to the court, including diplomatic functionaries, and many manuscripts acquired from outside the empire. Among the magnificent calligraphic specimens are practice pieces, karlamalar, albums of exercises featuring isolated letters, compounds, which you see here, and short exemplary texts, such as that beginning with the abjad sequence. 
also albums of Qatalar pieces featuring particular scripts with selected text and layouts. These include several which were produced by Taklid, again, imitation as a method of training, licensure, homage. Here we have a Taklid by Mahmoud Jalaluddin, an imitation of Hafiz Osman Afendi. He has even copied the signature of Hafiz Osman Afendi here. Also in the collection are albums of models for monumental inscriptions in stone, such as this remarkable piece by the master of Talik, Yasari Mehmed Asad Afendi. Also copies of the Quran, copies of special collections of Quranic chapters known as Anamlar, levhas or large scale calligraphic compositions that can be hung for viewing and contemplation in homes, workplaces, mosques, etc. And again, albums, in this case, massive courtly albums with bindings prepared for King Sultan Abdul Hamid, which together contain around 158 mounted pieces. The works of a significant number of Ottoman masters are preserved in the courtly albums and other volumes, and virtually all of them trace their lineage back to Sheikh Hamdallah by way of Hafiz Osman, whose work is also preserved in the form of a few kitalar and a magnificent hilya or written description or even depiction of the Prophet Muhammad in the graphic form which he elaborated. This is a tiny sampling of the richness within the collection. For now, we are honored to have the role of physically preserving these pieces and facilitating access to them freely and openly in digital spaces for those able to go online as well as in public exhibitions, such as at the Islamic galleries at the Detroit Institute of Arts, where we send a selection every year. And once our physical spaces become accessible again, there certainly in our reading room, teaching spaces and elsewhere. And we are exploring ways as ever to better support and enable that. It is immensely important that this heritage remain accessible to all who consider it significant and find meaning in it. Just as Shaykh Hamdallah was able to consult the works of Yaqut al-Mustasimi, Hafiz Osman, the works of Shaykh Hamdallah, and other students, the works of their masters and their master's masters. It is important for this collection to remain actively supporting the work of artisans as models and inspiration. And we are so fortunate to have such an extraordinary calligrapher with us today. Nihad, I very much look forward to hearing now from you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Evan, for this uh, very nice introduction. I appreciate that. And I want to uh, also welcome uh, all of the people who could join us today. It's nice of you to be here in this uh, late, cold uh, Friday afternoon. So welcome, welcome again, everyone, and thank you. It is an honor to be uh, in virtual presence with this magnificent uh, collection at U of M. Um, certainly it would be an honor for any aspiring calligrapher and for established calligraphers as well. I wanna thank Aisha Imam from uh, the Reed Society. She has been very dynamic in putting this program and similar programs together and I, also wanna thank Evan for all of her work um, and collaboration in this project. I don't wanna forget to mention uh, the great uh, tec technical team, technical support team from U of M, Eric and uh, Agar. Uh, thank you guys very much and uh, go blue. So with that, I would like to talk about a few things here. And uh, here's the list of what I would like to discuss. I wanna talk about the training uh, in the Ijaza system uh, of Islamic calligraphy. And then I wanna talk about some of my recent uh, pieces. And then I'll mention uh, lineage to Sheikh Hamdullah, the, our uh, topic, our person today. And then 
I will uh, touch on some linkage to U of M collection, uh, sometimes in a direct manner and sometimes in an indirect manner. So I, um, I got interested in, in Arabic and Islamic calligraphy when I was about 12 years old. And uh, it was driven by uh, love of the Arabic language itself. And uh, that was inspired by a very nice teacher. And uh, I was self-trained for a long time, uh, which, which can be very bad and very damaging in the sense that one can develop some very bad habits that uh, would become very hard to break. And then um, once I graduated from college and got my first job and made some money, I uh, made uh, a calligraphy pilgrimage to Istanbul and met uh, my first teacher, Grandmaster Hassan Chalabi, whom you see here, uh, he's a very fine man. Look at this smile and tell me if uh, you don't think this is this is a wonderful man. So I had the honor of meeting him and learning from him for about 11 years uh, on, on an official basis from uh, 1998 to 1211, where I received my certificate or my Ijaza degree. It's uh, the training is one on one uh, and uh, basically the knowledge and the science or the art of the and science of Islamic calligraphy is handed down to you uh, through uh, your teacher and so on. Um, if you notice, uh, if you look at the brackets here, I say 1998 to 2011, and there are three dots. And the three dots um, are a reminder that the relationship with the teacher continues after one finishes uh, his or her formal training. Uh, we, I still visit him as, as often as I can, and I take his opinion and his advice, and I continue to learn uh, from him. Um, at the top right-hand corner, you see a picture of my Ijaza. It's a, it's a hadith, a saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And then you see the writing underneath uh, certifying uh, me, basically, by my main teacher, which is Hassan Chalabi, and then another uh, witness master calligrapher. Uh, in this case, it was Dawood Bakhtash, who is uh, a great calligrapher in his own. Um, I moved to Puerto Rico and spent four years in Puerto Rico and I moved back to Michigan in 2005. And soon after I went to Muhammad Zakaria and I asked him to start studying Dalik style. My first ijaza, my first certificate was in Thuluth and Nasikh styles. And I wanted to get another certificate in Dalik style. It's very different than the others uh, or the other two styles. And I, uh, here's a picture of me and Zakaria Hoja. I uh, keenly observing what he's doing and listening to what he has to say, uh, as you see in the picture. And I spent uh, six to seven years training in uh, Talik style with Zakaria. And then you see another picture of me uh, with Zakaria uh, plotting something naughty, I think, by, can't remember what it was, by, by, by the pauses by the, and the, uh, the smiles, the grins on the faces. But anyway, after uh, six to seven years, I received my ijaza. I wanted to show you here in this slide, um, pictures of some of my exercises uh, with Zakaria Hoja. And uh, the, uh, the writing in red 
are the corrections. So these three examples represent the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good passing uh, exercise is the one at the top. Then at the bottom left, you see uh, bad, but okay. And then to the bottom right, you see the ugly exercise where everything pretty much was uh, was wrong and had to be corrected. So this is the kind of training a master calligrapher would have to go through, starting with single Arabic letters, and then uh, two letters connected, and then moving to uh, sentences and, and poems and so forth. So it's a, it's a grueling and very time consuming and demanding training. In 2013, we traveled to Istanbul and we were hosted by the Research Center for Islamic Arts and Culture and History in Istanbul. And we had a nice ijaza ceremony, uh, basically Zakaria here in the picture in the middle uh, shaking my hand and giving me uh, my certificate. Zakaria Hoja happened to be friends with the American ambassador to Turkey at the time. Uh, and you see the ambassador in, in the picture. They were neighbors in Arlington, Virginia. I didn't know. So Zakaria got him to come and attend, which was, which was very nice. On the right, you see a picture of my ijaza from, Has from Zakaria Hoja in the Talik style, according to the Ottoman school. And Zakaria was kind enough to do the abru and the tazhib, the illumination uh, and the binding as, as you see there. Uh, and I'm really honored uh, by that uh, gift from Zakaria Hoja. As part of my training and uh, to uh, link uh, this slide to what Evan had to say, this uh, business of taklid, uh, this the imitation of old masters as a method of learning uh, is really very important, uh, very key in, in learning Islamic calligraphy. So as, as part of my training with uh, Zakaria Hoja, uh, he asked me to imitate one of the great, or probably the greatest masters of the Ottoman school in Talik script, uh, that is Yasari Zade Mustafa Izzat. And uh, to the left, you see one page of uh, Yasari Zade's writing. And to the right, you see my imitation of him uh, trying to copy him as exactly as possible as part of the training. And this, uh, this training involved uh, 28 pages like this, uh, which is a very long text. It's an Ottoman poem uh, in the praise of Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him. So it took me that alone, that little project took me two years what I want to mention is um, the fact that the tradition that Evan talked about really continues until today. Here is a master who died in Istanbul in 1849. And here is uh, another person uh, who lives in Michigan and is imitating this great master in 2011. So the tradition really goes on, as you can see by this example. Zakaria liked this work and uh, he said, maybe we should collect this in an album. And we did, here are the 28 pages produced in an accordion album format, according to the Ottoman tradition also. And this is this, this format, this accordion format is exactly the same as the Muraka by Sheikh Hamdullah that Evan has at her collection. So even, even the methods and the production uh, continues according to the tradition. I took my 28 pages and uh, got them mounted and put some abru paper decoration 
and then gave them to Amuzahib, who put tazheep line or gold lines around them, as I will show you in a minute. Uh, we did that for the 28 pages, and uh, I found a young mujallid named Osman Duruk in Uskudar, Istanbul, who is trained in the traditional method, and he put the leather and the binding together. And here is, uh, here is the cover, the leather cover, and with stamps and motifs from the old Alaman period, probably 18th century. So it is produced in the, in the same uh, Ottoman school and Ottoman taste. Now, speaking of lineage and how the, uh, the tradition of learning and teaching uh, Islamic calligraphy, according to the Ottoman school. This is, uh, this is a, a, a family tree, if you wish, or uh, the lineage chart that goes all the way back to Sheikh Hamdullah, um, our person of honor this evening, really. And uh, he died in Istanbul in 1520. And you see how uh, different people were, were taught by him and became masters on their own throughout the century, the, cent the centuries until, until today, uh, uh, really. And uh, I want to mention at the bottom left, uh, where it says 1982, that is uh, the late uh, great component of the Ottoman school. Uh, Hamid Aytach. Hamid Aytach died in 1982, but Hamid Aytach is the teacher of Hassan Chalabi. And Hassan Chalabi is the teacher of Muhammad Zakaria. And both of them are my teachers. So I belong to this uh, tree and lineage, and I can trace my lineage back to the great uh, calligrapher and the founder of the Ottoman school, uh, Sheikh Hamdullah. Of course, let me, there is a caveat here. Not, not all calligraphers name are included here, only the great ones. So I, I doubt that my name will ever be included. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to explain to you how I can go back and trace my lineage. So there were probably thousands of calligraphers between now and, and Sheikh Hamdullah, but you only see a few here. These are the greatest among the greatest. So uh, their names are mentioned here and their teachers and so forth. So now I wanted to share with you some of my, uh, my pieces that are relatively recent. Uh, you know, we're talking 2013 to, you know, 2019, something like that. But I want, I want you uh, to see the state of the art, if you wish, and how, you know, our techniques and our, our productions uh, are done now in the, in the 20th, in the 21st century. Here is a piece in Jelly Talik, which is the large uh, version of the Talik style, okay? And with illumination uh, done by Miss um, Zahra Masumi, she's a, an Iranian Tazheeb artist, illumination artist, who lives in Ankara, actually. So uh, she did the illumination on on the piece here in 2014. And the Tazheep style, the illumination style that we now prefer is the 18th century Ottoman style. So we, we don't go back uh, further and we skip a century or two. So we go back to the 18th century, which kind of what you see in this, uh, in this piece. My, my second piece here is in a different style, as you can see. It is in Jelly Solos, this monumental, uh, very strong uh, style, the, the Solos style. 
again with illumination uh, done by Zahra Masumi, as, as you can see. And uh, this was produced in, in 2014. And now this piece um, has a story. Well, number one, this piece is, uh, is the piece that is displayed currently in the Beauty and Solitude virtual exhibit by, by the Reed Society. So you can, you can view this piece and others in the ongoing exhibit, yes. But this piece, or in this piece, I wanted to explore some of the older styles. Now, Evan, you mentioned that Sheikh Hamdullah wrote the six hands or the six scripts that he inherited from Yakut al-Mustasimi. Unfortunately, we stopped using some of these scripts. The Ottoman school, right after Sheikh Hamdullah, focused on Sulus and Nasikh. And the other six, or the other remaining four really took a back seat and they were hardly used, but I think it's a treasure. So I wanted to revisit them and try to bring them or some of them or some lines of them into the 21st century <clears throat> by using the techniques uh, that we have now. So. This is, a, this is a nice line that says in Arabic, Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. It's something that Muslims say when there is, when there is a, a problem. Okay, so it's, uh, it's something relevant, I think, in, in, in our times. And uh, if you notice the illumination is minimal, um, you have this small, uh, round um, color and gold design. And I want it to be truthful to the Mamluk period and the Mamluk manuscripts where this style was uh, in, in still in strong or prominent use during the Mamluk period in Egypt and Syria. And, uh, and this piece was sold to um, a good friend of mine and a scholar, Irvin Jamil Sheikh. It's in his collection now, and I think it's, it's a good home for it. So I'm really happy about that. There is another old basmala in this old script, Rika, which, which we stopped using for the most part after Sheikh Hamdullah. But I want you to notice, and this is an old uh, composition uh, sort of brought to life uh, in the 21st century. What's exciting about this style is, is its efficiency, its economy in projecting, you know, a lot of intensity. Um, it's very clean, as you see, it's very cursive, it's very bubbly, there's a lot of dynamic in it, right? And it's so modern looking, can you believe that you know, Islamic calligraphy writing had this modern lock, uh, you know, six or 800 years ago. I am personally very amazed by, by the potential of some of these old scripts as hopefully you can see here. Another piece in the same regard, this old style and uh, minimal, uh, tazheeb, minimal in illumination, just like uh, the Mamluks uh, used to do in their manuscripts. Uh, you know, calligraphers uh, never stop. They never stop writing and they never stop learning. So I am currently learning a new script, this uh, imperial script called Jali Diwani. And it looks like this, and the line of Jelly Diwani, the composition almost always takes this shape that you see in the screen. This uh, style was used in the court for writing official documents, and it was kept as a secret. It wasn't, it wasn't allowed to be taught to people who don't work in the palace. 
and the, the dots and the intensity of it and the compactness of it was intended so to protect it against forgery. But now anybody can learn it. It's not a court secret anymore. I also continue to train and I hear, for example, I went back to my very early training in Sulus and Nasikh by imitating Shauke Afandi and using his exercise book. Here is probably this is, uh, you know, a couple or three weeks old um, exercise that I went through. Uh, we continue on uh, practicing and polishing and imitating the old masters so that we stay in shape and we can improve our writing. The relationship with, with my teachers, of course, continues uh, in terms of, uh, you know, training in the calligraphy itself, but also training in the history of calligraphy and its methods and its schools and its evolution and everything that has to do with it. Uh, Zakaria Hoja was kind enough to take me uh, in a visit to the National Library of Medicine in Washington, D.C., because they have few manuscripts that go back to the 10th century. This is one of them, and we're inspecting it and seeing the writing in it and try to figure out some of the connections and get a feel of how, uh, how the writing was at the time by both copy, copyists and calligraphers. Copyists uh, are the equivalent of print shops. They were people who used to copy books very quickly for a certain sum of money. So this was probably one of them, but we could learn a lot about the period and the writing in that period. I want to advertise for uh, the Islamic Arts Festival, which is a virtual festival. If you go to islamicartsociety.org, you can have a link. There, there are many artists participating here, and it's tomorrow and and Saturday and 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 uh, Sunday, if you're interested. Uh, it's virtual, so anybody can go in and view. Uh, the artwork. We always long and miss Istanbul and we take every opportunity, well I do, to go there uh, once or twice a year uh, to visit my teachers, um, have discussions with them, learn from them, take their opinions uh, about some of my new pieces and trials and so on. Um, I want to mention that Hassan Chalabi Hoja said that all the great calligraphers, including Sheikh Hamdullah, uh, they lived and worked, they produced magnificent calligraphy in Istanbul, and they died there and they were buried in Istanbul. And his conclusion was. Islamic calligraphy is in the air and the water of Istanbul. So uh, I continue to, to visit Istanbul as much as I can. So thank you very much. And I think now uh, we're gonna open it for some questions. Beautiful, thank you so much, Hoja Nihad, and thank you, Evan. I see I, we, we're kind of short on time, so I'm just going to ask you the first few questions that have come up. Um, we had a question that someone inquired about any solitude practices of the speakers. I'm just gonna quote you, Nihad, from the Beauty and Solitude exhibition. Uh, you said, each of my pieces is a quiet invitation to meditation. If you'd like to expand on that, that would be great. <clears throat> yes, sure. Thank you. And thank you for the question. Um, Islamic calligraphy is very particular about the choice of the text. And the choices are either a Quranic verse or more than one verse or a Hadith, a teaching of Prophet Muhammad, or a nice poem 
yes, or a piece of wisdom. So if you look at any of the of these selections of texts, there is always a good message in there, uh, a good moral, okay? Uh, something, something to be contemplated, something to be, uh, you know, uh, dwelled on or, or think about, right? So, I do the same thing in terms of selecting the text. So if you read the text, you will hopefully pick up on that, uh, you know, whatever is included there, whether it's, uh, it's some wisdom or some beautiful poetry or, or, a, or an idea or a thought. So uh, that is sort of natural and it was, before and after the solitude and, and the pandemic, really. But, and more so during the pandemic. There is another question um, inquiring about if any female calligraphers' names are mentioned in the lineage tree that you shared. Um, I certainly mentioned a very important one, um, but as far as I know, there wasn't, is that right? Hojan, you have? Yes, and, and this is not um, discrimination of any sort. Like I said, the, the calligraphers that are mentioned are the top ones who left a mark on the Ottoman school. Now, the Hoja that you mentioned is, is uh, Abbasi, an, an Arab calligrapher, and she was so important because she carried the tradition from the founding father, which is, who is uh, Ibn Mukla, to the second founding father, Ibn al-Bawwab. So the link between these two great founders is a woman actually. So that is very important. That is a very important position and very important contribution. And um, I, I'd like to ask Evan. Evan, you mentioned uh, earlier between um, when we were all speaking about the, the Ziara, almost the Ziara aspect of people visiting the collection. Could you just expand a little on that and how, how you've seen people come and see the collection and, and um, how they approach it? Yes, absolutely. And of course, I would love to hear from Nihad about his um, experience, um, as well as your experience, Aisha, if you would be so kind and generous. I know that to be in the presence of the pieces is very significant, especially when there is a chance to um, consult them together with one's teacher, one's hoja, and um, of course, the 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 baraka, the the blessing which which is inferred just to 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 be present is is very significant. So we have had many um, calligraphers come to the reading room, and also, of course, finding the images online, <laughs> which is not quite the same, <laughs> but there is a virtual communion there, and. Um, yeah, my understanding is that it is very significant. I would love to hear uh, from you, Nihad, if, if you would be so kind, or even from you, Aisha, I know you have <laughs> made your own ziyaret, um, but when you have the chance to, um, to consult historical pieces such as these uh, in the hands of the, the old masters, how, um, how, how do you approach that? And what kind of experience is that for you? Well, um, it's, a, it's a very intense experience and uh, we approach them with reverence and humility because these are giants, okay? And we, I would wonder, you know, my goodness, I am looking at the work of, you know, the founding father of the Ottoman school you know, how great is that? I'm looking at a, a treasure basically of, you know, hundreds of years old, yes? And I would look 
after this Ao and shock, which is a quiet, intense experience, yes, it's very different from the phony Ua without reverence and understanding. So then I would, I would wonder what a calligrapher would wonder. I would say, I want to see how uh, dark the ink that he used was. And then I would want to see where did he put his pen first and where did he left it? the beginning of his stroke and the end of his stroke. How many times in, you know, in a letter did he dip his ink, uh, his pen in the inkwell? So I would look for technical things. I would follow the lines and the edges and wonder if Sheikh Hamdullah had access to a very sharp knife to smooth the edges like we do now. These things would come to mind. I would look at the paper and see how soft and how, how smooth it was and whether it changed colors or not over the years, you know. Um, I would look at the design and the phrasing. I would wanna look at where he put his, uh, you know, long strokes, for example, with respect to the line. And I wanna see how the line progresses. Is there a crescendo in the line? Is there a, a conclusion, a visual conclusion of the tension in the line? I would, I would be looking for things like that. I would ask myself, you know, how different is our writing from his writing? What changed and what seem, seems to remain the same? You know, oh my God, we still write the in in the same way that hasn't changed or so I would look for things like that. Wonderful, thank you. I think we should take one more question and then wrap it up. Um, someone asked and this, I, of course, I can relate to. How do you, when you're working on an ijazat, when you're working on calligraphy and aiming to get an ijazat, how do you keep yourself um, motivated when you lose all hope? <laughs> Is that question to me, for me? Uh, yes, Evan got her degrees. <laughs> I think, I, think, uh, I think you have to love what you're doing. And if you do, uh, then you can manage. I am not denying that there's going to be setbacks and frustrations and uh, feeling of, you know, uh, wanting to give up and things like that, but you're driven by love and and stubbornness, you have to be stubborn. You have to stick it. And if, if you don't stick it, then you know you stop, but you have to love it and you have to be very stubborn. Agreed, I think that's correct. And I think also um, it's a method for pausing, for learning how to slow down and be patient I think that's what I've experienced because, uh, yes, I mean, as a hopeful student, I've been working on it for a while. Um, could I spend more time? Yes, I could. Um, but it's a slow process. And I think there's a lot that is happening while you're um, on this journey. You're seeing things that you never saw before. I mean, you have to sharpen your eyes to be able to see slight variations in line. And the way we live now, everything is very like gross and very, um, it's not that refined. So I think the art of calligraphy helps us refine our, refine our vision and inshallah, our souls and our, our manners as well. So that's my two cents on it. Um, I have an interesting question for you, Nihad. He, someone spies an oud in the back. <laughs> Are you a musician, musician as well? 
Uh, no, I, I can't give myself that title, um, uh, but I like it and uh, I, I am learning it, but uh, I don't think I should casually give myself titles here and there because they seem to be going around so casually nowadays. So no, I, I'm not, I can't say that. But you love it, perhaps. <laughs> I do. I do, yes. Wonderful. I think, I think that we will conclude our program tonight. Um, I, I have to thank the audience for uh, attending and, and offering your attention. And I, have to, I certainly have to give a shout out to Gregor and Eric for um, technical support. I mean, they've been trained by 911 operators because we'll be panicking on one side and they're very calm. So thank you. And of course, thank you, Hoja Nihad and Evan for sharing your passion and expertise and time to this noble art. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you all and thank you and hope to see you at our next dialogue. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, Aisha, so much for the invitation. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Yeah.